most familiar with the fact that there is an alternative model, which is that in neighborhoods where housing construction is allowed to boom along with demand, you can have an influx of the middle class and wealthy without an exodus of the poor. So the South Loop in the 1990s, which boomed just as much as West Town, um, you see there's a huge influx of non-poor families, actually gain poor families over the course of the 1990s. There was no displacement, at least no net displacement. Unfortunately, the vast majority of American neighborhoods look much more like West Town than they do like the South Loop. And so over the course of the last generation or two, um, this dynamic sort of writ large has led to massively increasing economic segregation. Um, economic segregation is actually growing much more quickly in the United States than economic inequality. Uh, and so this is just sort of a sampling of change of the percentage of people in various metropolitan areas living in poor or rich neighborhoods. And you can see um, places like New York, it used to be 25%. Now half of all people live in either poor or rich neighborhoods. In Milwaukee, just to the north, it used to be 7%. Now it's 30 This is like a pretty dry looking chart, but this is actually this is a catastrophe. Um, I think we're all acquainted with research about what happens to people's life chances when they grow up in very poor neighborhoods. Um, we are creating huge numbers of segregated poor neighborhoods that didn't used to be there. Um, and the people who live in those neighborhoods are suffering the consequences. So what that means is it's not just, it doesn't just affect where I'm going to end up to be poor regardless of what I do, but yeah. it's even worse if I, grew, if I grew up alongside other poor people. Yeah, it's it's huge difference. Yeah. How are neighborhoods categorized as poor Um In this study, I want to say that it's I want to say that it's below 60% of average area um, income and above 130%, but it could be off by a little bit, but it's something like that. Okay. So this means that we might want to have, if we care about equality, if we care about not equality but mobility, people being able to get ahead in life. Yeah, it's important to have more mixed neighborhoods economically. Not just because equality is nice, but because the bottom is much better off being surrounded by a diversity of income. Yeah, right. Um, right. So, so you know, there's, there's no matter how you sort of divvy up the um, the income, you know, income. There's always going to be a bottom twenty or a bottom thirty percent, but it really matters where those people live for what chances they have in their lives. Um, and finally. Uh, zoning is behind Chicago's population problems. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware that Chicago lost about 200,000 people in the 2000s. The common narrative about why that was has focused pretty much entirely on uh, segregated black low-income neighborhoods on the south and west sides where people left to get away from failing schools and violent streets. Um, and that's true, that, that, that did happen. But the flip side to that is that Chicago has some of the most desirable urban neighborhoods in the country, certainly between the coasts. And you can see that these are two uh, maps from uh, city housing report. The one on the left is housing prices. The one on the right is housing price growth. And you can see that there's a huge part of the city that has very high prices and very high growth, indicating that there's lots of people who would like to live here. But none of those places are actually gaining population. Um, because, as we saw earlier, we don't build places for them to live. And as much as you might want to live somewhere, if you're not going to have a place to live, you're not going to live there. Yeah. To what extent does home zoning affect desirability? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So a lot of, so sometimes um, when, when people say, hey, we should build some more stuff here, um, people say, well, look, part of what makes this neighborhood so desirable is the, the character, right? That it's not super dense. Um, I think there are certainly some people for whom that's true, right? Some people for whom if you start densifying their neighborhoods, they're going to want to go somewhere else. And that's fine. What I what I have always asked those people, and I've never really gotten a response, is can you think of a single American neighborhood since the invention of indoor plumbing uh, where market-driven densification has led to a loss of demand? Has made more has made fewer people on net want to move there. And I can't think of a single example. There's certainly examples of where the government has built more densely public housing. Um, that would be the most obvious one. 
But in terms of, of sort of the market responding to what people ask for, usually it's actually the other way around. The more you build, the more amenities accumulate, right? More, uh, more stores, more places to go, uh, more jobs, and it actually becomes more desirable. So even for those who are familiar with a neighborhood like Logan Square, live or pick your neighborhood, right? Living right next to transit, right next to the main commercial area, if you like commercial stuff, way better than a 15 minute walk, right? Same yeah. concept, just at a bigger scale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, similar sort of um, feedback uh, loop kind of question. So do you think there's a, a, a very strong relationship between uh, people's, between the general ability to move to a place, like the fact that there's more that there's housing in a place and people moving there? Like, do people know about the fact there's housing in all places that there is housing? So I don't think it's so much. So it's it's not it's not just that like the existence of housing causes people to move to a place. Okay. Um, it's that the lack of housing in a place that people want to move necessarily prevents its population from growing. Right. If you when you look at the if you go back a couple slides and look, well, Lincoln Park has lost housing units. How could it possibly gain population? Right. People aren't going to like stuff themselves. I mean, maybe to some extent, but. Really, people aren't going to stuff themselves into apartments just to you know, fit more people. They're going to move somewhere else. Uh, just to play devil's advocate to yeah. your example or your question, couldn't you think of zoning as um, like a congestion charge, where you know lots of people want to use a highway and they're going to keep you know, as the route becomes more desirable, more people want to use it. That causes mm -hmm. a lot of bunch of traffic congestion. So you say, well, let's put a price on that. You know, similarly, yeah, you know, there's sort of a value to preventing more housing in certain circumstances. Yeah, um, I think I basically agree with that. I, I, would, I would say, so I am not some, there are these people do exist, I'm not one of them, who thinks that there should be no restrictions whatsoever. Um, there are problems with building, you know, more density, right? More people are using the same amount of space, the same amount of parkland, the same amount of transportation stuff. Um, I guess, I would say two things. Number one, that's partly offset by the fact that the city gets more tax revenue when you build more densely. Um, number two, there's actually a cost to forcing low density because you have to, right? You have to build, you have to build roads right to everybody's house. You have to build a sewer to everybody's house. You have to provide all these services that cost basically a certain amount per distance. And when you expand the amount of distance you expand the amount of money you're spending per person. Um, so there are, there, are, there are problems with building too densely. There are also problems financially with not building densely enough. And I would, I would suggest that you know, almost everywhere in the country, maybe you know, Manhattan is an exception, but almost everywhere in the country, we're much closer to the too little density causing problems than to the too much density causing problems. So how does, um, how does leaving the market to be unzoned not result in more stratification than would otherwise happen? I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, Cabrini Green, and they cannot build houses there because it's so expensive, uh -huh. right? So, you know, Wait, why who wouldn't you? Build houses? Uh, the Chicago Housing Authority is having a oh, problem okay. replacing yeah. housing there because when they, you know, tore them down, they had, you know, well, whatever it was, you know, 500 units, and they built, you know, 300, yeah. and they can't, you know, the cost of building the rest. So. Unfettered, right, without some obligation to provide affordable housing, why doesn't that result in Logan Square having high density and Lawndale continue to have the low density that it has? And those are what's what's to keep okay, yeah, poor people in the mix. Yeah. So I think so. I think there's two parts to that to, to an answer to that question. The first one is um, so. The first one is that. I don't want to give the impression, I was going to say this at the end, I don't want to give the impression that you can solve the affordable housing problem by building all the housing you want. Um, even if there were literally no restrictions, um, the price of housing is never going to be lower than the cost of producing housing, right? Because you just wouldn't, I mean, if you're like a rational business person, you're not going to do that. Um, and so people who don't make enough money to pay for what it costs to produce or maintain housing are still not going to be able to afford it. And at that point, you have a different question, which is, do you think it's important enough to, for the government to help those people afford housing? I think the answer is yes. I think that's like just as important as all of this stuff. Um, 
But if you don't do this stuff, then it's, but if you don't, it's even harder because it's right. even more expensive. But if you don't do this stuff, then and if you're well, giving, that's what I'm saying, unfettered yeah. by, I mean, if you have a, an inclusionary zoning requirement that says, or yeah. some kind of requirement that says you have to build 20% affordable, <laughs> yeah. in, you know, that helps, yeah. right? But but the reality on the ground is is that you have in Lawndale, you know, um, a lot of housing being abandoned that's yeah. not being repaired for the exact economic reason you're talking about yeah. because, you know, you, you aren't going to spend $100,000 building something that's worth 50. Right. right. Whereas you are going to do it in Logan Square. Yeah. I mean, so I think that's the second part. And this is actually, I think, the part that is, that's harder to sort of to come up with a solution for, which is that, look, I mean, one reason that places like, you know, Logan Square, like 10 or 15 years ago, was a kind of rough neighborhood, right? Um, or a place like Pilsen, uh, or, or parts of Bronze, or whatever. Um, and one reason that those places have had this huge influx of, you know, middle class people uh, and, 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 and money. Right, is that for, for precisely this reason that like, you know, all these twenty-somethings can't afford to live in Lincoln Park anymore um, because of zoning. And if you take away that incentive, if you make it affordable to live in a place like Lincoln Park, um, people aren't going to have the incentive to move to uh, Logan Square or Wilson or eventually maybe go to Lawndale. Um, and that, you know, it, it it makes it easy for money and people to leave those places. And that's a problem. Um, I guess. I guess. I guess. What I, you know, my 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 response to that would be: I don't think we can solve the problem of places like North Lawndale by making it even more difficult for the people who live there to afford to live anywhere else. I don't think that's the solution. Um, I don't know exactly what is the solution, but I think, you know, justifying. <coughs> Justifying artificially inflating housing prices to basically keep people out um, is not. I don't. I. I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned the cost of um, the higher cost of providing services uh, over a more widely spaced population, and yeah. I was that's, I was actually going to ask about that whether you had done any. Um, Visualizations or any studies of, of, of that aspect of it, um, because it, it, as I understand it, it goes beyond um, simply uh, a proportionally higher cost. In that, when you have a, a more widely spaced population, you're really dealing with essentially the square of the distance and the cost of providing those services, something like public transit. And then, as a result, you're facing disinvestment and actual like neighborhood loss. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I haven't I haven't done any sort of data analysis about that in Chicago, but it would be super interesting to do that. I mean, do you have any ideas about where you would just like mine city budgets or? Um, uh, I think there's some like cost per um, rider mile, vehicle yeah, mile actually, yeah, data, that's that that sort of thing. The, yeah. the city has uh, sensors on all its plows. GPS, so you could kind of look at that and then fuel and see if kind of estimate cost per mile depending on the density of the neighborhood. But that, that data is not open yet. Yeah, I mean, I think it would almost be because you have a much greater sort of like variance of uh, of density in the suburbs because you have some of the suburbs that are basically as dense as Chicago and other ones that are like not. Uh, so if you had data from that, that would be really helpful. Isn't that the stated uh, rationale for closing some of the schools in the south and west sides? Is the neighborhoods de-densifying? Yeah, although I would challenge that. In part, um, there are there are places where school enrollment is way down, but uh, the number of school-aged children within the attendance area is actually up. Um, a little known fact is that Chicago in the last 10 years has gone from having 100 public schools to 150. Um, when that happens, you spread kids a lot more thinly. And I think that is a, a large part of why uh, you have depopulation in a lot of schools. But, but actual depopulation is part of the problem. Yeah. Um, just to, I guess, address that woman's question, uh, I know the blog Strong Towns blog actually addresses the idea of spreading out cities and stuff like that and what that does to infrastructure and stuff. And cool. Gives us Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, one. Um, Question I um, policy related is you know one problem the city has in terms of building more housing stock 
is that when developers propose to build more housing, even that's consistent with the existing zoning, there's a community hearing and then the community gets really upset and they mix the proposal or they weigh, reduce the scale of it. Yeah. And what, whatever the formal amount of zoning that you're allowing, it's, it still doesn't translate into fully feasible development. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's pretty good. So, so that's sort of related. We have this system uh, called Baldermanic Prerogative in Chicago, which basically, it's like not written anywhere, um, but it's just how everybody does it, um, like a lot of things, um, where aldermen basically get to veto any project in their ward that they don't like. Um, we have a zoning board. They not interfere with a project in another right. ward, even though they, as a committee member or a counselor, they could have that charge. Right. So, so you know, right. So, 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 aldermen get to if they if they show up at a meeting and there's 20 people there screaming at them, they're going to say no, you can't do that because they don't want people screaming at them. Um, a more rational system that <laughs> other cities use would be to say that well, look, building yes, building a, this apartment building in this neighborhood affects this neighborhood, but it also affects the entire city, right? With uh, uh, tax revenue, it affects it with the overall supply, helping keep down prices. Um, you know, it affects the number of people riding the trains and the you know, and all of that. And so, probably we should make decisions about development at least in part on a city-wide level. But we don't do that. Do you have a question? Another devil's advocate there. Yeah. Um, it could be that the problem is not as bad as clearly that map is very red. Right? Yeah. But it could be that it's actually not as bad as it could be, because if you look at the zoning map in detail, especially in a lot of residential areas, the way zoning works is you've got these big districts. So in theory, you would take a whole chunk of neighborhood and you say, all these places should look the same, they're all residential, they can all build them up this tall, and so on. But if you actually look at these things, what happens is, when an element upzones something, what that means is they take a single parcel and draw a new little zoning district around it, and bam, we have a brand new zoning district. Yeah. And if you look at a lot, especially a lot of the neighborhoods that were blue earlier, those are the places that are developing and that our prices are going up and growth and so on, uh, they're just pockmarked with little upzone districts. Yeah. So clearly the, the market, to, to, to put it monolithically, is squeezing past the law to an extent. Yeah. Um, uh, but that also makes it so that every single decision is political, right? You have to please the aldermen, good or ill, and then you frequently respond to the, the loudest community group for good or ill, by the way. Um, mostly ill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, but I'm just saying, like, it's, it could be worse, probably. Yeah, so, so, so that's a good point. So there's something called PD, which if you're like a zoning nerd, you'll have heard of. Um, that stands for planned development. And basically what that means is there is some flexibility in the code. Um, if, uh, 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 if a developer wants to build something that's different from the zoning, he can say, hey, can I do this through planned development? And then basically he has a negotiation, effectively with the alderman, uh, to try and build whatever he wants. The problem with that is, number one, you have these massive public hearings in which people just, like, I mean, you should, like, either go to one of these or just read the articles about them. They're horrifying. I mean, the things that people say, they, sometimes they actually use words like riffraff. Um, <laughs> We're not trying to sound like horrible technocrats. Or I am. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I used to have these hearings a lot. You should seriously go to them. Because, so, okay. So Lincoln Park had this hospital that shut down, not the children's hospital, a smaller one next to it. Nice old building. There was a plan to have it be affordable, adaptive use, which means you reuse the building, green retrofits, new grocery store. Pretty much, it doesn't look like shit. Which is frankly, like one of the reasons people don't like this new construction is because the, the new stuff doesn't look even as close to what they built in 1920. Yeah, um, doesn't look like shit. Great, great project. Year and a half of meetings. A year and a half. Why? Yeah. Because there were people who have huge mansions in a historical part of Lincoln Square, and, and uh, yeah, which is beautiful, by the way. It's absolutely beautiful. But they're like, no, we don't want this grocery store because there'll be more traffic. And it's like, there was a hospital there before. Like, yeah. there wasn't um, ambulances at every hour, right? So people just like, when they're directly affected, every you and the, the next time someone tries to build something you don't like by your place, doesn't matter how rabid or an anti-zoning person you are. He will still go out and be an envy. We're all envies in some way. But the point is that structurally, uh, the people locally who have the loudest voice get the most say. Yeah. And there's no, what about me? What about the other guy who doesn't live in, in who's in another neighborhood, but is eventually affected in a small way by all these decisions that are made? 
Yeah, right. So that's the argument. It's not that like, oh man, democracy is terrible. Let's let's give a big payday to the to the real estate developers and the pinstripe suits. That's not the point. The point is that when the pinstripe suit people don't make money, the city as a whole becomes more affordable. And politically, these things are decided in these little meetings that are frankly anti-democratic. It's a lot. It's a lot of people in the community that get that get the, their way, and not some representative sample of the surrounding people. Yeah. Or all of us, by the way. No, I think that's exactly right. And and there are people who take this and this idea in sort of an anti-democratic direction. But the issue really is, it's not that people shouldn't be shouldn't have a say. It's that it matters who gets to have a say. It matters who is enfranchised. And the way these meetings work. Um, the people who are enfranchised are generally the most privileged people in the area. Actually, one like amazing example is in a uh, Ukrainian village. This guy wanted to open up a little like liquor store on, on Ashland, just south of Division. This was like a year ago, and um, but there was a there was a liquor moratorium in in the area, so there you had to get like special permission, even like above above and beyond just a liquor license to actually open a liquor store. <coughs> um, and so the and there's a really really active. Uh, neighborhood association there in in, in in Ukrainian village, and so the the first um, uh, agreement that this association came to with the local aldermen was that okay you can sell beer but you can only sell craft beer. You can't sell Budweiser. You can't sell PBR. You can't sell basically anything you know that costs less than twelve dollars per six pack. Um, and that, you know that is a decision that was supposedly reached democratically, but that clearly is not in the interests of the vast majority of people who would patronize that that location. Right? <laughs> and so that is like that, that sort of encapsulates what happened. That that wasn't the zoning decision, but that is basically the dynamic in almost every zoning argument. Um, it's bad. So I'm, I'm I'm almost I'm basically done. But so so what what to do about this? Um, there's a uh, build you build more, right? But the point I want to make before before uh, I stop is that a lot of few times when people say, "Well, we need to build more," people think about high rises or they think about at least mid rises, you know, like ten story buildings. Um, we don't need to do anything like that in like 95 percent of the city. Um, if you think back to that map of all the areas where you can only build single family homes, um, if we could build three flats in those places, we could triple the allowed density, right? By allowing three flats which are a super common form of building all over the city. Um, and even in the lakefront areas that are, that are denser, um, if we could legalize courtyard buildings, classic Chicago buildings type, courtyard, a three or four story courtyard building is over twice as dense as the maximum allowable density of 98% of Chicago neighborhoods outside of downtown. Um, you know, these are classic Chicago buildings that we've made illegal. All we really need to do is re-legalize them, and that we've solved almost solved the problem. Maybe you see a new one, a new two flat, the ones that don't look as good. Yeah, there was usually a previous two flat there. They rebuilt. They haven't added any to the neighborhood at all. They just made it crap. They just made it uglier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like uglier but more diverse. <laughs> yeah. I would trade, you know, less pretty but more stuff for all the reasons we just talked about. But that doesn't happen today. Right. Um, so, so last for those of you who are interested in this, either before or because this hopefully. Um, I am going to try to be demystifying some of the zoning code on my blog soon. Um, if you you can read the, the municipal zoning code online, it's like don't do it. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> but the the zoning is complicated. There's a million little moving parts, but the density part isn't actually that hard. Um, you can pretty easily sort of go from the the code, you know, RS dash three to how many units can you build on this lot. Um, and so soon I'm going to be putting up on my blog a conversion chart of, okay, if I download the zoning file from the data portal uh, and I see this like RT-4, what the hell does that mean? Oh, I can go to Daniel's blog. And uh, we, we did that already. Oh, you did that already? Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Well, never mind. Well, we did, though. We did do that. <laughs> you know what we haven't done, though? Yeah. Like, anything with land use. Yeah. Wait, where uh, there's a second city uh, zoning map. That yeah, we'll that's look. what we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, so does that have city. like units right. per? Yeah, we yeah we put in all that stuff. Floor area ratio. There's a bunch of stuff in this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean yeah. maybe not. I missed yeah. that. All right. Cool. Uh, well, never mind. We can collaborate. So no, yeah. At, at, Add on to that thing. Okay. Just take it. I was thinking of just making like yeah, really like, away with it. a chart. Okay. Yeah, all right. It's basically a big table. Okay. Cool. Uh, and uh, that's it. 
Ja, ja.